This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Allison Cook and Super Inframan. Thank you so, so very much. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at where did the road go? Dot com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Okay, a little introduction to this one. This is an interview I did a few months after I started Where Did the Road Go. I started in January, actually January 26, 2013. This is from March 16th, 2013. And I was uh, able to get George Hansen, author of Trickster and the Paranormal, to come on. And I know with some of these early interviews, a lot of people now aren't uh, seeing them. They're not in the RSS feed anymore. And uh, even on YouTube, they're way, way back there. So all this stuff is available on the website, but I figure maybe I'll, I'll pick out a couple of the ones that were really exceptional that I was really happy with, like this one, and uh, put it up in a new form. You know, clean up the audio a little bit, uh, boost it up a little bit, and uh, repost it for people who may have missed it. So this is an interview that was conducted back in March of 2013. It is not a new interview, although uh, we have been talking about having seeing if George Hansen wants to come back on, which would be great. But uh, for now, check this one out. Here you go. So tonight on Where Did the Road Go? We have on the line George Hansen, author of The Trickster and the Paranormal. How you doing? I'm doing real fine. Okay. How how long ago did this book come out? <clears throat> the book came out in 2001. Okay. So and it's been out, you know, about uh, 11 and a half years. And it, it's kind of a unique subject matter. Uh, the, no, I don't think anyone else has written a book like this about the trickster phenomena. No, I don't think so either. Uh, you know, I've been looking at... There are a few books that are somewhat in the same vein. One is Synchronicity, Science, Myth, and the Trickster by Combs and Holland. And another is Demonic Reality by Patrick Harper. Those are probably the two that are closest, but mine is rather different. I take a much more anthropological approach. Uh, those other two books drew more from union psychology than I do. And I draw much more from anthropology and sociology. But all of these things uh, help, all these books help illuminate the, the uh, notion of the trickster. Okay, can, can you tell people how you got involved in, like, researching the paranormal uh, stuff? Well, I got interested in all this uh, in the mid-1970s when there was the occult explosion. Uh, that was a time period where there was just enormous popular interest in the paranormal. It was a little bit more acceptable to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, coming out of the 60s, uh, there seemed to be a growing interest, up to, and it probably peaked about 1976, 77 period, and then it started to decline, but I got right in, involved in where it was close to getting uh, a very, very high level of interest. Uh, the government was involved in its uh, psychic spying program, and that was getting uh, reports of the that work uh, was were in the proceedings. The uh, IEEE, that's the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, that really caught my attention, and it was something that uh, this field had never been presented to me in any academic setting. You know, I didn't learn about this these phenomena and and any engineering or physics courses, and so it was just very intriguing to me. It was a really an intellectual challenge. Now, now you have worked at the uh, the Rhine Institute. Yeah, I, I, at the Rhine Research Center down in Durham, North Carolina, and then I worked uh, at the Psychophysical Research Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey. And, and that's kind of as close as it gets to being, like, scientifically accepted at those type of places, isn't it? Right. Those are... The, uh, those are... Were, Two of the major institutions that were doing research. I was employed full time in both places hmm. and received a salary. We had uh, contact with universities, but we were not directly affiliated with universities. Uh, 
So in, in the 1980s, uh, there were six laboratories in the U.S. that were doing uh, full-time research in these uh, topics. Uh, today, I can identify certainly one and one and a half labs, but the level of activity now is nowhere near what it was in the 1980s. Well, why do you think that is? Well, first of all, the funding dried up. That's uh, the major one. <laughs> so, I guess that would do it. <laughs> yes. Uh, the government psychic spying program was pretty much curtailed about 1995. Several labs had closed in late 80s and early 90s. So uh, uh, that's how this field is. There are times where it, it's rather active and money flowing into it, and times when it's rather quiet, and now is one of those times. <laughs> Well, it, it seems to be, uh, as a general thing, gaining popularity, at least with popular culture. I think so. I think, uh, the, for instance, the ghost research is quite big. There are a large number of uh, amateur ghost uh, research groups out in, uh, and about in this country, and there are a lot of uh, television shows on that same topic. The UFO topic still has some g uh, general popular interest. But the level of professional interest, uh, real serious scientific research, is way down. Right. What, and do you think that the ghost shows help or hurt the field? Uh, I don't know that they do either. There are pluses because it gets people interested, but it's very amateurish. A uh, number of them almost certainly engage in trickery, not necessarily the researchers, but perhaps the uh, camera crew and uh, mm. and the like, and perhaps even some of the so-called researchers. So it is an amateur uh, presentation. Many people get the idea that's serious research. Of course, it's not. That's not how real research is undertaken, with the camera crew following every step and everything <laughs> being plotted out uh, in a script. That's just not what research is about. <laughs> um what what do you think that you could do like a scientific uh, television show like that and keep people interested? Well, there have been certainly back in the eighties. There were a number of very good documentaries. Uh, BBC did an excellent documentary, and uh, even Unsolved Mysteries had a much better uh, presentation of real research than hmm. uh, the shows today. But so it can be done. Uh, and uh, capture interest. It's not how you wouldn't have a camera crew following you around if you were doing serious research all the time. Maybe occasionally, but not as a regular part of the uh, the process. I, I think it was the guy who uh, did chasing UFOs who had uh, been pretty upset about the way the show went, and he said something about how the producers said people like to watch people walking around in the dark with night vision cameras. Well, that may be. Um, you know, I've not been on any TV show in quite a few years, and <laughs> I really don't have any desire to be. So, so you don't want to walk around in the dark with a night vision camera, then? No, and I'm uh, generally not. <laughs> um, do you do you find that that makes a difference, like in the paranormal? Does it matter if it's night day? Do these things manifest more at night? Well. Most of my work has been done in laboratory-based uh, right. conditions, and typically we kept regular business hours, about 9 to 5 or or 10 to 6, somewhere in that range. So we did very little uh, actual research during the nighttime. There is some evidence that suggests there are certain times of day that may be more propitious uh, for experiments. There's some work on what's called local sidereal time. I'm really not conversant with that research and how it's been faring in the last uh, couple decades, but there was at least some suggestion that there might be some time periods that will facilitate ESP function. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, you've done ghost hunts and stuff before, right? Uh, I have done ghost research uh, and published two articles in a scientific referee journal, it's a rather slow and tedious process. Uh, what we did is we, we were approached by a number of people, and we took a couple cases. One a house in uh, New Jersey in which a variety of phenomena had been reported, doors moving, uh, apparition scene, and the like. And what we did is have a floor plan drawn up. And the family that lived there marked on the floor plan where 
phenomena were observed or experienced. We then made copies of the floor plan uh, without any markings on them and gave them to a series of psychics and a series of skeptics. The skeptics and psychics both walked to the home uh, with a person who had no idea of what had been previously reported. The family had left the, the home, and they would mark on the uh, floor plan where they felt uh, phenomena had occurred. The psychics would, and the skeptics would also try to guess where the family might have had some uh, paranormal experience. We can, so there would be rooms where there had been phenomena reported, rooms had not, and then we could compare how many times the psychics and the skeptics were correct in their guess, and there's a statistical analysis procedure that allows us to determine uh, the probability of matching correctly, and the psychics were indeed more effective uh, in identifying the locations than the skeptics. We also did this very similar thing with photography. We had a photographer walk through the house and take pictures. Then we would take the pictures, look at them, and determine. We could have people who did not were not familiar with the house, with the home, uh, determine if something kind of weird uh, appeared on the various photographs. And again, we would compare the rooms in which phenomena had been previously reported to see if they matched up with any anomalies on the photographs. And again, we found a small correlation there that did suggest that the, photograph, uh, the photographs were somehow influenced or had some anomalies in locations where there had been previous phenomena reported. That's a rather time-consuming process. Uh, it's rather dull to watch. It takes quite a few hours to do this. Uh, but that's the kind of research we did. Oh, I also used what's called an electronic random number generator. This is a device that's used in laboratory-based testing frequently for ESP and mind over matter experiments. It can be uh, uh, tested and the randomness can be verified. And what we would do is move a red light that would turn on and off, controlled by the random number generator, and move it to various locations in the house, and again, see if there's any correlation with areas that had been previously reported as, as people having experiences in them and those that had not. And again, we found some uh, small relationship there, not particularly strong, but that's the way uh, scientific research can be done with ghost uh, phenomena. Now, what, what would the, the random number generator show if it was something anomalous? How would that work? Well, typically we would have the light turn off and on uh, maybe once every second or two. And if the light turn, we would look for deviations from chance. Did the huh. light turn on much more than would ex be expected by chance in the locations that had previously reported phenomena, and would it be more close to chance in places where it did not? We found a slight relationship there. Okay. Well, let's see. And, and, and I think with nowadays, with the way television presents itself, it would be hard to take something like that and keep people interested in it. That's right. No, it, it's rather dull uh, to watch and even rather dull to sit through. You just <laughs> get up and sort of mechanically move things around and take your readings and then go home and analyze it. Do, it's not particularly exciting. Do you think that it, there would be any amount of evidence you could compile doing it like that, that mainstream science would take it seriously? Well, you can do much more uh, tightly controlled experiments in the laboratory. So ghost research, there's a number of methodological issues that are rather difficult to overcome. It, they can be, uh, but the strongest uh Stronger evidence really comes from laboratory-based research with uh, people, some who may have uh, psychic talents, and even we've gotten some rather good results with people who've never been involved in uh, uh, parapsychology experiments before. Uh, those can be controlled quite tightly, uh, and they have been, but 
the acceptance for the scientific community is something, it's a very different matter. And that's basically why I wrote my book. Okay, now, now, can you give people an idea of what exactly the trickster phenomenon is and what the book is about? I know it's not easy to summarize. No, the book is 564 pages, and it jumps over a wide, wide range of uh, areas of, in the paranormal. Basically, paranormal uh, historically has been associated with a considerable amount of deception. It's also been viewed as sort of taboo or marginal or sort of disreputable. It's not well accepted, and people look upon it with a certain amount of fear or trepidation. Other people find it really fascinating and plunge right in. But overall, there's something of a slight taboo against it. You do not find uh, parapsychology, Bigfoot, or UFOs studied in many universities. And when they are studied and discussed, it's usually with one class. There are no departments devoted to the topics. Uh, religions also have a certain ambivalence toward testing these types of phenomena or even uh, trying to engage them. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church explicitly prohibits the practice of clairvoyance, for instance. And other religions have similar restrictions. So the phenomena is sort of sort of like a bastard stepchild or something. <laughs> People don't want to get too involved with it often. But there are times when there is more openness and when there's periods of transition or major cultural change, there seems to be an upsurge in interest and a, a little bit more acceptance of studying the phenomena. This certainly happened in the 70s, uh, with, in the 60s, with the Watergate, and with the, in the 60s with space exploration, uh, the sexual revolution, the civil rights movement. All of these uh, indicated some really deep-seated cultural changes in our society, and during that, those periods of change, there was a greater openness. A similar thing happened in, with the Soviet Union. When the Berlin Wall fell and in 1989, the whole of Eastern Europe showed a dramatic increase in the interest in paranormal topics. This was very widespread. So again, the openness to these phenomena tends to occur during times of transition and change, during times of some instability. So again, that suggests there's something about this phenomena that is more at home in unstable and unsettled conditions than in more regular and routine uh, instances. Hmm. So that's much of what my book is about, is why there is this uh, subtle antagonism or hostility to the research. And it has to do with the nature of how our society is organized. People in very elite positions, uh, major scientists, major news media, generally shy away from these phenomena and discussing these things. People at the lower orders, uh, lower socioeconomic classes, uh, tend to be a little bit more open, and if you look at the media, the tabloids, of course, are <laughs> are overjoyed <laughs> to cover these kinds of things. Right. Well, I, I, I find, one of the things I find interesting going on now is a show like Ancient Aliens seems to be getting a very wide group of uh, people interested in the subject matter. Like a well, I can't, can't really judge that. How many people are subscribing to the magazines and, and the journals on that topic? Is it just people watching? Well, they could go to a, any movie theater and watch all sorts of uh, fictional portrayals of uh, similar types of events. Oh, true, true. I, I just find, like, I find people I wouldn't expect to be interested in stuff like that raving about a show like that, and that, that I think that's a good sign. Well, what you find, though, with the entertainment industry is you find people have a great interest in the entertainment aspect, but how many actually sit down and read the uh, serious literature on these topics? Mm. Very, very few. So 
Although, I do think the phenomena provide really a wellspring for entertainment use, but typically there's a certain ambivalence toward these phenomena, and when people are really pressed, are they really serious or not? Often they're not. And what you really have to look at is the number of people who may join serious organizations that want to study this, and from what I can tell, that's really a very, very small number of people. Huh. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, the the uh, Mutual UFO Network, which is probably the largest UFO organization in the country, their membership typically is around 3,000. Hmm. haven't checked recently, but a few years ago it was in that range. So that's a small number. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Do you think that... I mean, obviously the ghost thing is popular, but why, why do you think UFOs haven't taken off the same way with all the, the videos of UFOs and everything floating around? Well, the UFOs were really big in the early 90s. Yeah. There were lots of conferences. The uh, attendance at conferences was uh, quite high. Uh, but it comes and goes. Right now, ghost research seems to be bigger among the hobbyists. So the hobbyists have probably pushed more into the ghost area for whatever reason, and that will likely change in the next 20 years. Do you, do you think there's ever going to be like a unified theory of the paranormal? Well, there are theories of the paranormal, and I think my own work on the trickster is, a, is something in that direction. But let's face it. These phenomena, paranormal or supernatural phenomena, have been reported literally for thousands of years. They have been discussed and debated for thousands of years. This is the nature of these phenomena. They do, inv uh, they do promote controversy. They do uh, promote debate. And things haven't been settled for a very, very long time. I don't expect that to change very much. So in, uh, in your book, you talk a lot about um, the way that even genuine uh, psychic research sometimes tends to lead toward uh, fraud at times and, and fakery. Well, the, the phenomena, whether it be UFOs or psychic phenomena, mediumship, Bigfoot, uh, the fields have been filled with cases of hoaxing and fraud. It's been, psych, psychic research has been around for well over a hundred years, and you can go back to the very earliest days. And fraudulent mediums, fraudulent psychics were rather high profile, and that's still pretty much the case today. Uh, the most high profile uh, psychics one should be a little bit more suspicious of. So the field has always had that taint. And certainly there have been a number of researchers in all these paranormal fields who have been quite gullible, quite willing to be taken in by people who claim abilities or claim to have had UFO contact. Now, I must say that I've known lots of psychics. I've had many friends who have had UFO experiences, many friends who have had psychic experiences experiences. And by far, the large, large majority of them are quite honest people. However, the people who get especially noted by the media generally are a bit more likely to engage uh, in fraud for whatever reason. Now, do you, think that, that, do you think that they're not genuine to begin with, or do you think the fraud comes in because they're being put on demand? Well, Sometimes the fraud is consciously perpetrated. Other times it's not. One of the most famous uh, mediums in history was a woman named Eusapia Palladino. And she would warn experimenters uh, because when she would try to produce phenomena, she would go into trance. She wasn't really fully in control of herself. And she would warn the experimenters and the researchers to hold me tight or I will cheat. <laughs> so there is something that takes over the medium, whatever it is, an unconscious process, a spirit, whatever, that tend to 
perpetrate fraud. And this may not be in the intent of the medium, but this is what happens. In other cases, yes, some psychics will feel a little bit of pressure and give in to that. Uh, but if an experiment is conducted well, uh, with good controls, it should be very, very difficult uh, for uh, a psychic to cheat. And there are some extremely tight controls that can be imposed, and you know the psychic can walk around and do whatever if the controls are on the target system itself, uh, whether it's the electronic random number generator or an object that is meant to be influenced. There are ways of doing it. Most researchers are not too familiar with those, but there are professional journals that go into some of the details that are needed in, in controls. Now, you're, you're also a sleight-of-hand magician. Well, I'm a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. I performed uh, when I was much, much younger. I do not claim to have any ability <laughs> to perform good magic. Performing magic takes lots and lots and lots of practice. I'm right now not willing to engage in that much practice and <laughs> devote that much time to it. But, but you... I do try to keep up uh, with some of the new effects that are on the market, and I do read the Magic Magazine more regularly. Now, does, do you think that helps in the field of psychic research and such to be able to detect when someone is, is perpetrating a fraud? Well, if a person is engaged in psychic research and has not studied magic, I consider them basically not competent. Hmm. They, they shouldn't be doing the research. Uh, if they are consulting with people, and uh, maybe it's okay, but if they are evaluating research where there's possibilities of cheating, and in most cases uh, there are possibilities, they're not really very well qualified. And, and I know a number of people who have old professorates uh, who do publicly uh, discuss and research and, and actually conduct research, and these people just have not studied magic, and frankly, I don't think they should be taken seriously. Hmm. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, now, getting back to the trickster a little bit, how, how would you say the trickster manifests, manifests in the field of UFOs? Well, the, the UFO phenomena it is, is just has rampant amounts of fraud and hoaxing. You can go back to the very earliest days of ufology in the late 40s and early 50s, and there were hoaxes perpetrated. A number of the researchers themselves uh, had later admitted to faking UFO photos. Uh, there is an en there's an enormous amount of government disinformation there. Uh, also, the trickster is more than just uh, fakery and deception. Uh, the trickster manifests in instability and marginality. UFO groups are notoriously unstable. Uh, the groups never uh, get very large. They never have what a normal business would have, like offices and paid staff. Uh, the Mutual UFO Network, which is the largest organization for many years, was uh, housed in the, in the home of its director, Walt Andrus. For a short period of time, it had a storefront, and for a short period of time, it had a very, very small office out in Colorado. Uh, that was probably at most, and I visited probably a couple hundred square feet at best, so these uh, groups that study UFOs are very marginal and very, uh, uh, very tiny operations. Even a regular church has a much larger annual budget than the uh, largest UFO organization in this country. <laughs> that is a trickster characteristic. The UFO phenomena is marginal, and the groups are marginal. You don't find any serious research conducted by universities. There are maybe historical studies done of UFO claims, but to go out and study the phenomena directly, no, you almost never find that in large institutions. This is a property of the trickster. Now, the, the, the phenomena itself, however, also behaves like a trickster much of the time. Well, yes, it, it is transient. 
it does show up. It does, at times, it does seem to respond to human consciousness, to the expectations and beliefs of uh, people involved. So that makes the phenomena itself something that may not be possible to be objective about. In normal science, one believes that the experimenter doesn't really influence what one is observing. But with paranormal phenomena, it appears, and there is a lot of laboratory evidence to suggest that subjects and even experimenters are influencing the outcome of an experiment psychically. That makes objectivity almost impossible. And that is a real stumbling block, but it is also an important property of these phenomena, and we have to study these phenomena using methods that are perhaps a little bit different than normal science. And such as what? Well, Jacques Vallée wrote a very interesting book um, titled Messengers of Deception. And in that book, he suggested that perhaps methods used in intelligence may be useful in the study of uh, UFOs and related phenomena. Also, literary theory and ideas from mythology and folklore can be applied. In fact, the, my work on the trickster uh, draws very heavily from literary theory and from anthropology and from mythology. Uh, these are not particularly known as scientific disciplines, but they do give considerable insight into the operation of these phenomena. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, a lot of this book, George, is about uh, something called liminality. Yes, that's a term that almost no one knows about. And frankly, I don't know that any of your audience should be expected to know it. But it was derived from anthropologist analysis of rites and ritual. It's a rather complex term, but let's remember that in earlier cultures, rituals were used to control and channel supernatural powers. So right there, we have a connection with this. Now, liminality refers to a transition state. Limin uh, is from uh, uh, Latin being threshold. So a person moving from one state to another, for instance, from child to adult, there is a transition period. And in our culture, that's a rather long period of time, the teen mm -hmm. adolescence and teenage years. But in earlier cultures, they didn't want a whole bunch of whacked out teenagers running around. They had to be children or adults. Teenagers can be rather disruptive, as most people know. <laughs> so what earlier cultures did, they had an initiation. And during the initiation period, uh, the initiates, usually early mid-teens, might be thrown out into the wilderness for a while. They might be allowed to plunder uh, the tribe and take whatever they wanted. Uh, they were looked upon sort of as ghosts or spirits or like birds. They were off on their own. But this was a very limited period of time. And during that time, they got to know their fellow initiates very well. They bonded with them. And in some sense, it was a bit like um, Marine Corps boot camp where they were sort of ground down, they were thrown out, they were given ordeals they had to uh, uh, undertake. And they were separate from the rest of society for a while. And there were rituals at various stages here. So it's in this transition period where they sort of went wild uh, that phenomena might tend to occur. And the whole tribe, the whole society would be involved. And this was a liminal time. Now remember, in poltergeist phenomena, it's the period of adolescence that seemed to be more likely to promote poltergeist phenomena. Right, right. Another liminal period is, be is between life and death. There is often a period 
when a person dies, that people are more likely to encounter an apparition or spirit of the person. And that's usually within a few days, maybe up to a week. Now, it, it can continue far, far longer than that. But during the, the uh, life and death transition, virtually all cultures have funeral rites. And often, the funeral rites and, and, and that period of time, uh, just around the period of death, can be kind of disruptive for society. And people's emotions uh, kind of take them take over them. For instance, uh, my sister-in-law's church uh, for a while allowed viewings, uh, but the police had to be called so many times because of the of the uh, the problems with the people that the church decide, okay, we're not going to have any more viewings on our property. <laughs> so it, it, it's, the, these periods are sort of dangerous. They're upsetting. They're kind of scary. And so cultures have rituals to reincorporate people because their status has, ch- has changed. From child to adult, you've got a new status. From life to death, there's another status. You're looked upon differently or you looked upon as something different than you were before. And these periods were, are called liminal. They're at a threshold. They're sort of betwixt and between. And it's in periods of change, of transition, transformation, of flux, this instable period, where these phenomena tend to be reported much more frequently. And so that itself, I think, gives a bit of a taint to these phenomena. People are a little bit apprehensive about them. Mm. So the concept of liminality has been expanded in many, many ways. But this just gives you a little bit of a hint about the nature of these phenomena. These phenomena tend to occur in periods of change and transition. Remember, a few minutes ago we were talking about the change of the fall of the communism across Eastern Europe. That's when the phenomena tended to erupt. The late 60s and early 70s were again a a time of change in uh, the United States. And again, there was a large upsurge of interest in these phenomena. In the late 80s and early 90s, we had a recession, and we saw a surge of interest in the UFO topic. Now, now do you think some of that comes about because people are looking for something to just cling on to when they're they're in uh, periods of change, or do you well, think... that's part of it, but they're also open to more possibilities. Uh, for instance, if a person loses a job, uh, they're not going to work uh, five days a week. Their routine has changed. They're going to be needing to look around. They're going to explore other, other possibilities. Think about how life is and see what else is out there. What uh, are the opportunities? And in periods of change like that, people are just aware and try to become aware of more things. And so I think it uh, simulates a bit more openness. Do, do you also think maybe it shuts down the, the uh, what, what Anton Wilson used to call the robot? Yes, absolutely. Uh, because what most people do is they have a very set schedule. Uh, Two of my sisters have been soccer moms, and their lives were scheduled from about 7 in the morning to about 9 at night. Uh, They had very little free time, and they had a very rigorous schedule. Now, what's been shown is that when people kind of break out of their routine and try novel things, they're more likely to experience synchronicities and other kinds of paranormal phenomena. I know when I've traveled, especially to Europe, uh, I've had a number of synchronicities occur. And the book Synchronicity, Science, Myth, and the Trickster went into this at some length. Uh, For instance, when i was been in Europe, I have run into people from my hometown walking on the streets, (laughs) which uh, was really quite a surprise to me. Uh, And very, you know, and often... Uh, when I was walking in, you know, I lived in a rather large town, uh, I rarely ran into someone I knew. 
<laughs> so it was uh, just one of these synchronicities. And laboratory research tends to support it. When people break out of their routine ways of responding or operating, these phenomena tend to occur a bit more frequently. Now, do you think that's because we notice them and they're, they're happening all the time? Or? No, the la laboratory research suggests otherwise, that there is something else going on, that this novelty tends to promote it, this, this change uh, from a routine behavior. So it's, it's our consciousness interacting with this, whatever yes. it is. Yes. Well, could you even define what it is, other than just saying it's the trickster in a sense? Well, what we just, what I, won't, I won't define it, but I will describe it. Okay. We can describe the conditions under which it will occur. We can give a an idea of what kinds of phenomena are likely to occur. Well, uh, uh, to try to describe it, I think, is premature. To, 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 to explain it fully, what we are trying to understand is how it works, when it works, to whom it works, for whom it works, and that's what we can do right now. What do you think it says about the phenomena itself, that, it's, that it is inherently dependent on us? It certainly interacts with us. It, uh, it, it involves human consciousness. Uh, that we really can be quite sure of. And what does that, but, say, about, what does that say about human consciousness? Well, it may have much more influence on the world than we realize. Our dreams, our expectations, our hopes, our beliefs, our uh, fears all are likely to influence uh, the manifestation of these phenomena. And with the UFO phenomena, you can kind of see that on a large scale, just as like um, we didn't see spacecraft until the, the late 1940s. Before that, they were airships. Before that, they seemed to be the fair, you know fairies and right. elves and such. But it seems to be responding more to a society belief rather than an individual. Uh, yes. Uh, I think that the UFO phenomena does manifest in in response to societal beliefs and expectations. There is also an individual aspect to it as well, though. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I think two are. I think both are are operating. And wouldn't that make the UFO phenomenon one of the more interesting aspects to study because of its like visibility in a sense? Well, it certainly can be more interesting, but it's much harder to control. Yeah. So to impose scientific controls uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, however, yes, it is a very rich area to study, and it can be studied ethnographically. It can be studied with surveys. So, yes, science can be done, but it's not going to be directly involving the phenomena so much, although there may be ways of doing that. Well, are you at all familiar with Wilhelm Reich's work, where he would, said he was able to actually summon UFOs into existence with his cloud busters and stuff? I'm vaguely familiar with it, and I know other people who've used other uh, techniques to summon UFOs. So I'm certainly open to that. Uh, I haven't, you know, I've listened to a few lectures and read a little bit about Reich, uh, and I don't uh, dismiss him. Okay. Uh, he had some very interesting ideas. He was also a very marginal character, way out on the cutting edge or the fringe or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So I don't discount uh, his ideas. And, and I think he was very much attacked and maligned for it as well. Oh, very much so. No, uh, he was uh, put in prison for some of his work. Yeah, and that's where he died. So, uh, again, if one starts messing with these phenomena uh, in a large way, one needs to be rather cautious. And uh, what I do is I try to talk to friends of mine, keep them aware of what I'm doing, and have uh, some friends who are more skeptical so I can bounce ideas off. Now, now when you say skeptical, are, are you saying... Like, I always define true skeptics are, as people who question everything. They don't necessarily believe in anything, any one thing, but they're, they're questioners. Uh, but a lot of times, skeptics nowadays are just people who are very close-minded and not willing to look at different, you know, options. No, those people, the people who are not too open-minded generally are not all that worth talking to. Sometimes they are for certain purposes, but uh, I think it's, helpful if you have 
friends who have a more skeptical orientation, still open but still challenging uh, um, me or or whoever uh, might be presenting a case. Right. And I find that usually much more valuable, those kinds of people much more helpful to talk to than people who are just willing to accept uh, uh, claims. And it seems like you've always kind of played that role, too, of the, the skeptic in a lot of this, despite being so involved with this research. Yes, I've published quite a number of very sharp critiques of research, uh, and I expect to continue doing that. I haven't been quite as active, but uh, I have a number of papers and a number of uh, letters to editors uh, commenting on poor quality research, uh, misuse of statistics, and bad methodology. Now, do you think that's because people are trying to make it seem like there's more to it than there is, or are they just not doing it the right way? Well, they're making errors. They're not doing it right. Uh, uh, there are the methods for statistical analysis are pretty well understood. The statistics are used in a huge number of uh, different uh, industries and uh, uh, scientific disciplines, but it's rather easy to screw it up. Statistics... Uh, is a complex field, and many people who use them don't really understand them very well. Yeah. So most people are just making honest errors and or simply ignorant, haven't read uh, the relevant literature to know how things need to be do, done correctly. All right, so in your book, too, you, you discuss the uh, narrowing down of, like, scientific disciplines, and uh, you, you want to get into that a little bit and how that's, that's not necessarily a good thing? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not necessarily a good thing, especially in paranormal fields. Uh, what we see in paranormal fields is that the laboratory parapsychologist will study ESP and mind over matter. There will be some other people in par the parapsychology uh, area that study life after death. And they're rather separate from the people who do the laboratory research. And then you've got groups like uh, MUFON or the Center for UFO Studies, they focus on UFOs. And in fact, MUFON has had a policy for their state directors not to talk about psychic aspects of UFOs to the, the general press. Hmm. And then you've got uh, people who research Bigfoot, and they often do not want to hear about UFOs or psychic aspects. <laughs> However, if you start looking at the data and you start talking to people who are, have these experiences, you find an enormous amount of overlap uh, among these phenomena. For instance, virtually all of the U.S. government psychic spies have reported UFO encounters. Hmm. That's really a surprise. Not if you, it's not a surprise to people who've been involved in the field and pay attention, but for most people, that comes as a shock. Also, there have been a number of UFO flaps in which Bigfoot sightings have also been reported. Also, people who have had UFO encounters seem to be more likely to have experiences similar to near-death experiences. In fact, uh, Kenneth Ring, one of the major investigators of near-death experiences, has shown the commonalities of NDEs with certain types of UFO experiences. So what we see is that there is a, a large blurring and merging of these paranormal phenomena. Now, most organizations that do the studies don't want to admit that. But by doing so, and by narrowing their focus and limiting this range of phenomena they study, they fail to understand the much larger picture, and hence get very much sidetracked and do not understand what they're dealing with, do not understand the side effects of these phenomena, because these phenomena do indeed have side effects. They intrude into uh, people's personal lives. They have implications for the status and the employment, employment ability of some of these of people who get involved in these topics because there is a taboo associated with these topics. Also, 
people who have very strong experiences seem to have a bit more difficulty in personal relationships. And after some strong phenomena, people tend to be more likely to divorce. So these phenomena are not necessarily benign and just uh, normal. These have really profound effects on personal lives. And one can start noticing this if one starts looking across these different paranormal fields. And this says something very fundamental about the nature of the paranormal. And I go into this at some length in my book, talking about these blurred categories. These are categories that merge, and when they merge, the phenomena tends to become a little bit stronger, it seems, in Hmm. in the personal lives. And it becomes a little bit weirder. Uh, There's an idea of high strangeness that is encountered. Uh, Men in black phenomena, people who show up after UFO experiences, uh, and sometimes seem very strange or even a little bit threatening. So when you've got all this blurring and merging, uh, people get very, very uh, concerned and apprehensive, and so they tend to pull back. That's a key aspect of this phenomenon. People like to talk about these things and like to joke about them, but when it really comes down to experiencing them, That's something else entirely, because these phenomena are not quite categories like many people think they are. Now, do you think that's also partially because, like, the researchers themselves have a belief system and they don't want that threatened? Like, um, Bigfoots are, are, you know, unknown animals, and that's that. They can't be seen with a UFO because that doesn't... Absolutely, and and there's good reason for them to, to hold those beliefs and hold those categories, that they want to be known as a researcher into a certain small area. That way they can study that area by itself and make some real progress. And that's how normal science is done. I, I can't really fault the researchers too much. However, they are going to miss the bigger picture. And in doing so, if they don't step back and look at this bigger picture, they're likely to... Uh, go down some paths that are not going to be productive. Now, I understand, and also, if they got, start merging into and in, intruding into these other areas, if you, you're studying ESP and then you study UFOs, the scientific community is going to look at you as a real crackpot then. <laughs> so, I, I understand why they do it and why they specialize, but I think that's fundamentally going to be misleading. And do you think that's what's kind of kept the UFO field so off track as far as to its, its very nature? I think so. And, but I'm not the only one who said that. Jacques Vallée was saying similar kinds of things 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. John Keel and Jacques Vallée were talking about the, sim- the commonalities of fairies and folklore, elves and leprechauns, uh, in, comp- in comparison to UFO occupants. So... And they also knew that people who had uh, UFO experiences also experienced psychic phenomena. So I'm not the first to say this. This has been recognized for a very long time. But there's lots of pressures and forces to keep people from exploring uh, all these realms to get yeah, in well, photo. It, it seems like a lot of researchers want to believe that UFOs are very much physical, nuts and bolts crafts, and they don't really want to consider anything else along with that. Oh, well, that's very much true. In, in fact, I would say that's especially the case in the large, in the people high up in the major UFO organizations, whether it's the Mutual UFO Network or the Center for UFO Studies. Uh, that's what you will find. Uh, however, if you talk to the rank and file, the people who pay their dues and get the magazines and journals, those people often know that there's a lot of overlap. And if you go to UFO conferences, you can talk to people in the audience, and they will certainly acknowledge that these that psychic experiences uh, are a frequent accompaniment of UFO experiences. However, the people at the top don't want to acknowledge that. I remember when uh, Whitley Strieber 
after he put out communion, he was one of the people saying that, I don't know, you know, he didn't know what this phenomena was. He wasn't saying it was a nuts and bolts thing. He wasn't saying, you know, because he honestly said he didn't know. Right. And, and he was getting attacked from some sides because of that, because he wouldn't go with the nuts and bolts sort of uh, yes. explanation. Yes. There are people uh, that are very wedded to that explanation. And, yes, people who step out into these other weird paranormal areas are going to be ostracized. And Whitley Strieber, as you said, was a very good example of that. He's not alone. And he's also a very good example of how all this phenomena kind of interacts. He's had so many different experiences that beyond the UFO field. Yes, yes. Uh, Strieber is a very interesting case study. Uh, the blurring of fantasy and reality uh, is really occurring there. It's really hard to know. And I, I, I think Strieber is quite honest when he says he doesn't really understand or really know what's going on. Hmm. Uh, but these phenomena do tend to blur fantasy and reality. If, it, if these phenomena are shaped by our beliefs and expectations, then that is likely to occur. Okay. It's very subversive. It is very destabilizing. And that's one reason people tend to back off from it. Do you think this is also why a lot of people involved in the UFO field tend to lose their minds a little bit over time? Yeah, they tend to lose, well, if not their minds, at least their critical judgment. Yeah. They tend to start accepting a lot of things that they shouldn't. Yes, I think that's very definitely the case. And that's one reason I like to go to meetings of skeptics, even the hardcore skeptics. Mm. I find that useful. Mm. Uh, most people don't like to do that. I do. But it does put one back in the rational world, because if you get too sucked into these phenomena, time and time and time again, I've seen people lose critical judgment. Hmm. And uh, now, <laughs> the way you put your book together actually has sort of a liminal element to it. You, you, you put it together in such a way that uh, you can read any chapter at any given time without having to go sequentially. Well, yeah, <clears throat> that's a very good point. And because I couldn't figure out a linear way of presenting the material. So I tell people at the beginning, uh, jump around, open up the book. If, if, the, if the first few paragraphs you read start to make sense, continue. If not, jump to something else, because I cover everything from union psychology to anthropology to literary theory to reflexivity uh, and math, a little bit of mathematical logic. No, very few people are going to be able to to follow all those topics. And I cover UFO experiences, uh, performance magic, people like uh, David Blaine, David, uh, David Copperfield, Harry Houdini, people like that. So it's a real hodgepodge. So I don't expect people to, to be interested in everything there. So yeah, the categories are, and it's kind of a jumble, and the trickster often jumbles things up. Right, right, which just kind of made it a brilliant way to put it together. Um. The, and it took you how long to write this? I, I spent eight years on it. Okay. I, I came across a very interesting article in 1993, and at that point, that drew a number of ideas together, and I realized, okay, I can now make some theoretical process progress on this, and I spent the next eight years thinking and writing and reading. <laughs> is, is this the only book you have published? Well, I've published two other books that are catalogs of a private magic library, uh, the Milburn Christopher collection. Uh, Milburn Christopher was one of the most eminent uh, uh, performance magicians uh, of his day, and he also had a very strong interest in psychic phenomena and wrote three books on paranormal mm -hmm. topics. He was quite skeptical, but fairly open-minded. So I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work on, on it, that project uh, part of the time while I was writing my work on the trickster. Now, this is available on Amazon. Do you also sell it on your webpage? Uh, it's available via Amazon, and it's available uh, from uh, the publisher Ex Libris. So I don't uh, sell it myself. That's too much hassle for me. <laughs> okay. But uh, I believe there is a Kindle edition now. Uh, so uh, it's available in hardback, uh, softback, and uh, electronically. Any plans to write another book anytime? Well, I'd sure like to, 
but I don't have eight years <laughs> to devote <laughs> full time to it. I've got to make a living right now. <laughs> but I'm certainly writing, and I've got lots of writing projects underway. So I hope to kind of do occasionally put something on my blog. That's been quite a while. I've got a couple journal articles I'm working on, and I am on Twitter, and occasionally I will uh, put something on there, uh, a link or a book or something I find particularly interesting. And, and what is the website so people can find you? It, uh, my website is tricksterbook.com. Tricksterbook, as one word, dot okay. com. Good. And if you put in George Hansen and Trickster into Google, you're likely to find it. <laughs> Did, was was this a hard sell to the publisher because of the content? Well, actually, this is <laughs> print on demand. Ah. Uh, I paid a little bit of money, and then they put it up, and uh, they did it. So uh, today, almost anyone can do a book, and I was I, it was fortunate that print on demand was uh, becoming available when I was working on this, and so uh, it is sort of a vanity press in, in some sense. Uh, but I did approach a number of publishers, uh, didn't really get much interest, and so I published it my, basically myself with the help of Ex Libris, which was very good at the time. Ah. See, I, I, when I read it, I could read about a chapter at a time, and I had to put it down and just kind of let it sink in. Well, that's what I recommend to people. That's a, that's a great way to read it, uh, because it is rather densely written. It's... Uh, I don't think the work, the writing is too bad, but it does take a lot of time to absorb the ideas. Yes. Many of these ideas are not what are, is commonly presented. Yeah, it's it's, so. ve it's very well written. It's a matter of completely changing the way you look at things as you read it. Yeah, and still, I have a problem getting back into <laughs> looking at things that way myself sometimes. <laughs> you have to sit down and think, and I think a lot with examples, and that helps me think. Yeah. Uh, but but you're right. It's uh, it is a different way of thinking, and sometimes <laughs> it's hard for me to do it. <laughs> and that says something when the author is having a hard time with it. Okay. But er but earlier cultures thought differently than we do. They had different ways of categorizing things, different ways of thinking, and that's what I'm try which I tried to capture. Yeah. Well, a whole different way of seeing the world, really. Yeah. So all right. Um, well, we're just about out of time. Um, I guess one last question would be, what, what would you see for the future of psychic-type and paranormal research, uh, ideally? Wow, that's a really great question, and it's a really hard question. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to require a, basically a loose network of individuals who have a serious intellectual and academic type of orientation. And I don't think it's going to flourish very well in large organizations. We're going to have to have networks uh, with things like print-on-demand and open-access journals. I think uh, those can be established with relatively limited funding. Uh, I think there's something like an invisible college, people around the world who are, can communicate and uh, uh, present materials at uh, conferences. There are some very, uh, I think, hopeful uh, uh, indications. The journal I'm particularly excited about is Paraanthropology. It comes out of uh, the University of Bristol in England, and it's edited by a graduate student named Jack Hunter. It's free online, and I certainly urge all your listeners to go and take a look at that. There are like eight or nine issues out now. Uh, it's somewhat uneven quality, but it's progressively been getting better and better. And I think it's one of the most hopeful uh, indications we've had in quite some time. Awesome. Okay. And uh, I thank you so much for this interview uh, and your work. The book really just kind of, as I said, it, it changed the way I looked at things in, in ways that most books cannot do. Well, thank you. That's a real compliment, and I, I'm gratified. And I recommend any, anyone out there interested in the paranormal pick this up and at least flip through it at random. Yeah, it, it's not an easy read, 
uh, but it's not too hard either. And I recommend it only for people who have been involved in the paranormal for a few years. If you're a, a beginner, it's probably not something you're going to want to tackle. I, I guess that, yeah, I guess that's fair. Okay. Well, thank you again. The website is what? Tricksterbook.com. All right. Thank you. I want to take a moment here to give a shout out to all my patrons. All of you help make this show possible. I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Frank Earl. Nagatha Christie, Patricia W., Barbara Fisher, Will Powell, Big Boy Limina, Craig Parmenter, Walker, Joanna Rojas, Maddie, Dale Potter, David Moore, Vincent Trewell, The Great Change, Sam Sharon, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Becky Trainer, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Edu Camahort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Taylor, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, Matthew Sproul, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sunby, Dominic O'Malley, Christopher Vaughn, Super Inframan, Riker and Stark, Tim, J. Otto Bullet, Kevin Shrek, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Linz Jackson K., Allison Cook, Alfred Tuttle, James Lattimore, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you so much for helping make this show possible. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>